books come with an individualized access code to our interactive practice studio. This studio is where we keep all the digital aspects of the book that gives students and teachers multiple ways to internalize the skills that the books teach. IPS gives a way to practice on your own with tracks, um, send recordings to teachers, and it even goes through each of the pages of the books and there are various videos and audio tracks that you can use to help sharpen your skills. Um, and every book that you purchase comes with an individualized code on the inner cover. Um, the videos on our IPS is what Bruce and I will be using during the presentation tonight. So if you see any videos or images of pages, those are all available to you on the IPS once you obtain a book and a code. Tradition of Excellence by Bruce Pearson and Ryan Nowlin has been a staple in band programs all over the country because it is one of the most comprehensive and innovative method books available. The music, the dynamic look, the scope and sequence, and the tools for differentiated instruction um, and the interactive practice studio make Tradition of Excellence the fastest growing band method today. With auxiliary repertoire books, including holiday classics, concert time, and Tradition of Excellence in chamber music, your band can use the same method to learn anything you would want to program on concerts, preparing any students for the things they will face in the future. Thank you for joining us tonight, and here's Bruce. Thanks for attending our session, Inspire Excellence in Your Young Band. I'm Bruce Pearson, author of Standard of Excellence Comprehensive Band Method and the co-author along with my friend Ryan Nowlin of the Tradition of Excellence Comprehensive Band uh, Method. We're so glad you're here today and what we're going to do is we're going to be talking a little bit about how to get started on and giving those students a great start on several instruments that I'm going to demonstrate. We're going to talk about teaching music reading and we're going to also talk about some of how to teach some of the unique features of each uh, uh, instrument that I'll be demonstrating uh, for today. You know, excellence starts at the very first lesson and it continues through graduation. It not only gives your students the best possible uh, education as it relates to such things as uh, enjoying music and the process of music making, but it's also critical that they, the students learn such great things as perseverance and how to be really exact in what they're doing uh, rather than so many things in today's world today, the students aren't given that chance or are not required to um, pursue excellence like they do in the instruction of music. And as I said a minute ago, it starts teaching excellence and, uh, and achieving a culture of excellence starts at the very first lesson. I mentioned a moment ago about students enjoying music and the process of music making through excellence. But here are some of the things that I'll call the ancillary val values of excellence uh, uh, culture. One, A, is help. it helps to recruit more students. That's because students want to be a part of a winning team so that the better the program is, the more students will want to jump on board. It also helps to retain those students in the band program for similar reasons, because students want to be a part of that, something that is really special and a quality band program is something really special. Some other things that we as band directors uh, always want, and that is to garner the support of the parents uh, or guardians. And that's because when I teach and when I recruit students, I don't recruit just the student. I recruit the family made up of the parents and guardians because they're going to be a, uh, an advocate to keep that student practicing for you. I think we all want to make sure we have good administrative uh, support and the, the better the program, the more administrative support that you'll, that you'll certainly get. But as I've said now for the third time, creating a culture of excellence starts with that very first lesson and continues on through, uh, through graduation. So let's get started. Today we're going to look at woodwind and brass instruments, whereas on April 6th, our webinar is gonna be how to inspire and how to teach percussion to those young students, even if you're not a percussion uh, teacher or major, but we still want to achieve 
excellence in our program, don't we? So let's talk about getting uh, the most important thing at our very first lesson with our woodwind and brass players. Now, you know, some of us may have other ideas about that, but my um, emphasis is gonna be on tone quality because if we don't have a good sound, no one's gonna want to listen to it, regardless of how fast we can move our fingers or uh, play high notes and so forth. Unless we have a great sound, we're gonna have uh, a difficulty in, in attracting an audience or uh, retaining the students in our band program. Students know when they sound good and when they don't sound good. So we're gonna talk about tone quality as it starts. Um, and for today, I'm gonna to talk about three instruments with implications to others. One is going to be the flute. Flute is kind of unique, a unique instrument in that it has different, it has a unique way of starting, unlike most other instruments. Then we're gonna talk about clarinet, B flat clarinet, and its implications for the E flat alto clarinet and bass clarinet, but also implications of how uh, to start our uh, saxophone players. And so uh, those will be our woodwinds that we'll look at. But then we're also going to look at in brass. We're going to take a look at the, tr uh, the trumpet and with its implications and how to affect it affects the other brass instruments. Then we're going to move on to teaching music reading and then the unique qualities of each and every instrument. So let's get started. The first thing we need to do is we need to uh, determine uh, how, how do we get a good uh, tone. Tone on our instrument, assuming they're playing a, a decent instrument, is going to be dependent on air, embouchure, and the third component is a good model. They need to know what it sounds like. What are they trying to achieve? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, the model later on, but I'll just say this from the get-go, that a good model can be produced either by you as the teacher or their private teacher. It could also be uh, produced by maybe a friend, maybe a colleague that can come in and teach that instrument that you're not so comfortable with. Or you can always uh, look at the interactive practice studio that comes with the books because we have hired professional musicians to demonstrate those great sounds. So that's how you can achieve a model. So air, embouchure, and uh, a good model. So let's tackle the first one, air. So how do, what do we do with that? Under air, there's gonna talk about a posture. I'm gonna share with you how I teach um, a good posture. For that, I ask my students to sit tall, their back is straight, and their back is way off of the chair. In fact, I like to teach it so that the students feel some of their weight on their feet, because what that does is it relaxes the abdomen area, which is gonna be where we're gonna have some expansion. And unless they're sitting uh, properly, with their back straight, back off the chair, and some weight on the feet, they won't be able to have the proper expansion. Now, oftentimes I go through some uh, rather extensive breathing exercises, but for the purpose of this, I wanna talk about how I go about teaching uh, the inhale. So the posture is good. Now we're gonna move on to the inhale. So as we say that, we have to say, well, each of us have specialized ways of teaching uh, inhale or breathing, but lots of times we need to do it in a quick uh, manner so that uh, we can get on with the music making. A lot of my uh, conducting today has to do with teaching uh, honor bands, whether it be all state or all region uh, honor bands. And I have to come in and within a very short period of time, I have to teach them how to breathe correctly because without proper breathing, we're not gonna make a good sound. So the first thing I do is I ask the students to sit up tall and straight with their chin parallel to the floor. And that's important because if their head is down, they're not gonna be able to open up their throat to breathe properly. And for that, let's keep in mind the height of the stand. What I oftentimes do 
as I'll ask our students, to point their finger at their very first note on their musical page. And then I'll ask them to adjust their stand so that they're pointing their finger at my hands. Now, not only will they have a better a line of sight, but what that will do is you'll find that most of your students will have to lift their stand, which causes them to lift their entire, uh, their entire body carriage. I'm gonna then ask them to, to inhale the word how without making a sound. Now, keep in mind, when I inhale the word how, I'm gonna turn it right around. Because if I hold it in, that means I'm gonna have to close off my throat. So I'm gonna ask them to inhale like this. Again, chin is parallel to the floor. Next time, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask them to exhale. Now, some of us may refer to it as blowing. I don't like to use the word uh, uh, blowing because once they inhale, the blowing oftentimes looks like this. And that's precisely what we don't want. So to get around that problem, I asked the students to take a small piece of paper and draw a target on it. And the reason I do the target is because I want them to hit the target with their exhale. So let me demonstrate. And notice how the shape of my mouth is when I hit the target. It's a great way to start an embouchure uh, going for them. So once that I have the posture, and just to review, tall and straight, back ears straight, back off of the chair, some weight on their feet, I'm gonna teach them how to inhale, and then exhale, and of course that is by hitting the target. Now once we're going on and we've got air, I said the second component was embouchure. So for that, I'm going to take a look at uh, the, starting with the flute. Now, as I say that, I, I always ask my students to uh, provide for themselves a mirror, a small little mirror, and, uh, and I have them put it on their stand. Nowadays, what we can sometimes do is have the students use their phone if your, your uh, school allows that and allows them to take a selfie of themselves because we're going to take a look back and forth at what they're going to be asked to do and asked to replicate from this lesson. So next what I do is I want to teach jaw flexibility to our flute players. And for that, I'm going to turn just a little bit sideways. And what I'm going to do is show you how my jaw moves as I play flute. Notice. And to help achieve that, what I do is I ask the students to hold their arm directly in front of them. I ask them to have them take a nice big deep breath using the how technique, and then to direct the airstream up and down their arm without moving their head. So of course their chin is gonna be parallel to the floor, and so we're gonna inhale. And if you'll notice, I had jaw movement. And so the jaw movement is critical because frankly, that's how we're gonna teach the students uh, early on to make sure they're hitting the backside of, well, let's call it the blowhole on the head joint, but also teaches them how to shift registers on their flutes when they get a little further on down the road. So it becomes critical that we teach things right from the beginning that are gonna be used right uh, from the beginning. So the next what I'm gonna do is after we have the jaw flexibility and we direct the airstream up and down their arm, I'm gonna ask the students if they would shape their mouth like this. We, two. They're gonna say two syllables. We, W-H-E-E, -E, and two, T-O-O. -O. And they're gonna hold the first syllable while they say the second. So it's we, two, we, and notice when we do that, the jaw is forward. Now, I don't know how far forward it is exactly measurement wise, but it's so that the lower lip is directly below the upper lip. 
And so make sure that the jaw is forward. Now I have an overbite. I'm a flute player. I have an overbite. So for me, I have to make sure my jaw is sufficiently forward so that my bottom lip is right below my uh, upper lip. Now, having said that, um, and after having written these books, I, I, uh, a wonderful flute teacher came to me and said, Bruce, I really like you know, what, you do, what you're doing, but let's try something else. She said, here's how I teach my uh, uh, flute players to have a good embouchure. She said, I just ask them to say the word beautiful, beautiful. Now let's stop at the end of the first syllable. Beau, ah, great embouchure producer. So as we do that, we're gonna to want to look into our mirror or our phone and wanna see what that aperture, the opening in our mouth looks like. Now, if, if it should look, look like a, a, an American football, I say that American because sometimes when I've taught overseas, they, they call a, uh, what we call here in America, soccer, their football. So it looks like an American football. And if it's too flat, I ask them to say more uh, two. If it's too round and open, it's more hui. So then again, we want it to shape, uh, make it shape like a football. So hui, two, or bu will achieve that for you. And we want to make sure that they're using their a mirror or their phone to make sure that they make that adjustments early on. The next thing I do is I ask them to take their right index finger and I have them put their arm out uh, in this manner. And the reason I do that is because it's going to now shape uh, their, where their head is and all of that as if they had a flute in their hands. So I put it under their, um, have them put it under their lip I have them to take a nice big breath of air using the howl. And I have them look in the mirror to see that they're able to uh, retain that nice shape of that embouchure. And so we'll do that quite a bit. Well, some of you may be saying, boy, this is, a, you know, pretty slow going. And I'll, I'll admit it is, but I also would like to say that going slow is the fastest way in my opinion. So consequently, I spend a lot of time making sure that their mouth is shaped properly before they even um, pick up any other part of the flute. So once we're able to do that, uh, I ask them to take the, their head joint of their flute and we're gonna have them do exactly the same thing as they were doing with their finger. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have them plug up one end of the um, flute. I'm gonna have them feel the opening with both lips and I'm gonna have them roll it down and make sure that the uh, center of the aperture is centered on the blowhole. Now I say that and emphasize that because as I mentioned earlier, I'm a flute player, but the opening in my lips is not centered. I can't do anything about it. So what I have to do is I have to move the head joint so that it is centered, the opening in my lips uh, as the aperture is centered on the blow hole. Then it's parallel to my, uh, to my lips. I'm gonna feel the opening with both uh, of my lips and I'm gonna roll it down. I'm gonna look in my mirror again to make sure I'm covering approximately a third of the hole. And I'm gonna play a note. And the note that I should play is a second space A with a closed head joint. Now I say that because it's important to keep in mind that the pitch that the student plays on their head joint, or now as we talk about some of the other instruments, like the clarinet with mouthpiece and barrel or the saxophones with the mouthpiece and neck or the trumpet with their tuning slide pulled, the pitch that they play will determine their tone quality. Now, so we're look, we want to play a nice A. The better in tune the A, the better the tones are going to be. 
Now, once you're able to do that, I'll remove my hand. And now they should play an A an octave higher. Now, how are they going to know if the A is in tune or not? Thankfully, in our, um, with our IPS Interactive Practice Studio, with uh, the books, you're going to see that there's a tuner in, uh, in, uh, in, in there. One of the uh, things that you can achieve is getting that tuner so that the kids can look at it and say, oh, I'm sharp or flat or whatever, because listen, if they play a real flat A, I'll first of all play a good A. If they play a flat A, notice what happens to their tone. And, or if they play a sharp A, notice what happens to their tone. So the pitch that they play will determine their tone quality. So if they're playing a real flat A, They're going to want to roll their head joint out until they get a good in tune A. And the converse is true. If they're playing a real sharp A, they're going to want to roll it in until they can get a well in tune A. And so they're going to use the, the tuner that comes uh, right with the uh, IPS to determine what. Uh, picture and how do we make that proper adjustment. Now, once they're able to do that, I teach the students how to articulate. Some people use the word tongue, um, and but it's been my experience that when I use the word tongue, that becomes the problem because they focus all of their attention on their tongue. So, and this is the only thing now that I teach fast before slow. And that's because the fast movement tongue is a small movement tongue and a fast tongue is puts the tongue in exactly the right place without thinking about it. So again, I plug up the end. I ask to have them whisper like this. Whisper. I would never want my students to um, practice or start tonguing by using the words toot 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 because it causes too much jaw movement. So they whisper it. And by the way, if you have students who have been playing actually for many years and are having tonguing problems, you can always fix it up by having them whisper and then put it on their instrument. And then slow it down. And so on and so forth. And the reason I teach t uh, articulation at that time, at that moment, is so that I can have a real clean start when we start to play and read um, our, our music. Now, saying that, if we don't do that, we're gonna come up with a who, who, and we don't want that because we want a nice clean start, uh, don't we? Now, as we get started with that, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna teach the students to um, have good hand position. And frankly, I use a lot of things that uh, maybe seem a bit unconventional, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna see how effective it can be. So when I teach uh, flute, I make sure that I have a tennis ball. And I ask the students to pick it up. And then with both, you know, one hand after another. And then I'll say, okay, you've picked up that tennis ball, let's rest the flute right against the lower knuckle. Now, if you'll notice my flute, and I use this for demonstration purposes, and I put a sticker on each of the keys where I'm gonna want the student's fingers to eventually go. And these are just little garage sale stickers that I've picked up over the years. So I'm gonna ask them to make a C, and notice how I'm gonna, where I've put this sticker, where their uh, thumb, excuse me, their, uh, the base of their index finger goes. On the back side, I'm gonna put a two right here so you can see where the, it goes there. And then with the right hand, I have them put it right here and notice how it's not exactly directly under, but it's more towards me as the player. 
Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach the students to play right from the beginning and keep the understanding that the left hand pushes in and the right hand pushes out. And I'm using just the base of my left finger and the thumb of my right finger to achieve that. And so consequently, I can hold the flute without putting any fingers down because I've seen a lot of young flute players play like this because they're afraid they're going to drop the flute. So once we're able to uh, get a good sound on our head joint, boy, we're uh, on our way to getting a good tone quality. And therefore, I'm going to want to show them how to, uh, how to start on a note. So for that, I'm going to ask them to open up their Tradition of Excellence book to page number four. As they open up their uh, book to page number four, you're going to see in the left-hand corner in red where it says a flute lesson. And that's because there are three ways to start beginners. You can start them either in a like instrument class, privately or a like instrument class, or you can start them in a, uh, a family uh, or like a woodwind class, like flutes and clarinets and saxophones. If I start my beginners in a like instrument class, such as flute here, I would start on page four. And if you'll notice, the notes that they're being introduced are B, A, G, the three best starting notes. And I say three, because if you teach anything more than three notes, the kids are gonna be just really confounded, confused with all the fingerings that they've got to know. Now let's suppose uh, you are required to teach in a woodwind class, as I mentioned earlier, flutes and clarinets and saxophones. If that's the case, I would want you to have them start on page number five, because on page number five, as we go to it, you're gonna see that their starting note is D. Now, that may not be the very best starting note, but keep in mind, whenever you move away from a light instrument class, there has to be some compromises. Now notice that the notes are D, E flat, and F, and I introduce those notes to avoid the so-called break between D and C on flute. If you're starting your beginning band class with all of the instruments, then I'd, I'd suggest you start them on page number six. So let's take a look at page number six. And on that page, again, it's the same starting notes. So it's D concert, E flat, and F. So that's how I would start our, our beginners. Now, as we uh, go through the book, we're gonna see some, a few of the unique exercises. Keep in mind that most of the books have approximately 12 to 15 videos because I'm fully aware that we can't always give private lessons to our kids. So we created videos that deal with uh, many of the unique problems, you know, such as the third valve slide technique or alternate positions on, on trombone or how to shift registers on flute since we're talking flute. So let's move now. We've talked a, a bit about flute. Let's move now to clarinet. So another woodwind instrument. So for that, what I'm going to do is I always teach with um, a beginning clarinet with the mouthpiece and barrel. So the first thing I'm did, going to do once the, I've got the read on, and as you know, when sometimes if you're teaching a beginning clarinet class, you're just happy if you can get the, the read on and your students. But what I'm going to do now, I think is going to be really, really helpful. You know, in the early days of my teaching, I was so concerned that the chin was pointed, I was going up and uh, making some adjustments. But if you follow what I'm going to suggest that you do, you're going to automatically, automatically get a great pointed chin and a great sound. So the first thing that I'll do is I'll take again that same sheet of paper that I had, that I drew the target on. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide it between the reed and the mouthpiece. Whoops between the reed and the mouthpiece. And where it comes to a halt, a stop, I'm gonna draw a little line on the reed. Now, some of you might feel a little bit uncomfortable with that, but if, if that's the case, just to have them imagine where it stops, but have them put their thumb right underneath that line because that's your thumb is going to be the, what we'll call the stopper. 
because the stopper is where the bottom lip bumps up against it. So I'm gonna to say to the students, okay, shape your mouth as if you're saying, we too, again, just like we did on flute, we too. And what I'm gonna ask them to do is put their top teeth right directly on the mouthpiece and then seal it all the way around. Now, keep in mind this, and we're gonna talk a little bit more in a moment, but a, uh, a clarinet embouchure is what I like to refer to as a stand-up embouchure. And for that, that means that my lower lip is gonna be firm. It's gonna stand up. We're gonna talk about saxophone in a bit and how that's different. Top teeth directly on the mouthpiece. We seal it around here. We say we too, and we play a note. That note needs to be a concert F sharp, a top line concert F sharp. And by doing so, they're gonna get a great sound on their uh, clarinet from their very first lesson. And so what we find is that the key to playing with a great sound is to be able to play the correct pitch on their mouthpiece and barrel. Now, I wanna share with you something that you're gonna find, and I don't want you to be frustrated, or the students to be frustrated, but sometimes the kids cannot play with that good F sharp. And if they can't play with that good F sharp, again, I'll demonstrate, they might play a lower pitch, and rarely will it be too high, but almost always it'll be too low. And when they play with a, other than an F sharp, here's the type of tone quality. And we find that it, uh, they have to fix that up. So the kid comes in and says, how can I fix up my embouchure? And how can I get a better tone on my clarinet? And so here's the antidote for that. If they're playing too low, you have them shape their mouth more, ooh, ooh. And what that does is it changes from and the tone quality changes from simply by playing the correct note on their, um, on their mouthpiece and barrel. Now, having said that, I have found that sometimes even some of my students, as much as I'll say, more ooh, more ooh, they can't, still can't bring it up to the proper pitch. And so for that, what I do is I, I need to make sure that we strengthen these muscles. And for that, I take a swizzle stick and I have them put it between their lips, not between their teeth, but between their lips and hold it. And through the isometric contractions, little by little, this will strengthen. And then little by little, they'll be able to bring it up to the proper pitch. Now keep in mind too, I use the tennis ball a lot for hand positions. And once they're able to get a, um, a good hand position, then I'm gonna start them on their best starting note. Because remember, I want all of my students to be successful. And frankly, uh, the, the only way they can be successful is if they start on the right note and then the right sequence of notes. So let's take a look at the clarinet book and let's take a look at page number four. Again, we're talking about inspiring excellence. And so if we take a look at the left hand, uh, it, it says in red, clarinet lesson, and notice the starting notes that I have there. Very similar to what's required of the flute players, starting with the thumb and first finger, and then just dropping fingers down. Now, if that's the, if you're starting in a like instrument class or a private lesson, you're gonna to want to start on uh, page number four. Whereas, if you're starting in a, a family of instruments, like a woodwind family, flutes, clarinets, and saxophones, then you're gonna to want to start them on page number five. And on page number five, again, if you'll notice, we have to make some compromises, but we still start on that D concert, which is the E, of course, and the notes will be E, F, and G. And if we teach them in the full band, then the notes are gonna be on page number six, 
those same notes on page number six, E, F, and uh, a G. And so again, the best starting notes are going from an E down to a D down to a C. And next best would be E, F, G. But again, anytime we leave a full band, anytime we leave a private um, a lesson setting, we're gonna have to make a few compromises, but the compromises we make must never uh, jeopardize the good pedagogy of teaching those students correctly. So let's now, let's talk about some of the other instruments. The same thing is true using the paper behind the reed, and that's gonna be true of all single reed instruments. So for alto clarinets, I'm gonna want them to be able to play with their mouthpiece into the neck, I'm gonna want them to be able to play a third line B, like in boy. And so again, if it's too low, they have to say more ooh. If it's too high, it's more gonna be more O. Oh. Bass clarinet, same principle, using the paper, but they're, uh, the bottom pitch uh, we're gonna ask them uh, to be is going to be a D flat right below the staff. And again, if it's too high, it's more O. If it's too low, it's more O. You know, a number of years ago, and I'm gonna switch just briefly now to um, the saxophones, but a number of years ago, I was invited to train Japanese um, band directors, teachers, on how to start uh, their beginners. And I remember one time I was uh, teaching and I'd given this demonstration and, and so they, uh, asked to me to prove it, and they provided for me a 45-piece um, middle school aged band. Uh, it had sort of the middle school instrumentation, a 45-piece band that had like 18 alto saxophones, and they all had that alto saxophone sound, you know, the sound that'll part your hair from about 30 feet away. And so I asked them to take off the neck of their alto saxophones and find the middle spot on the cork and draw a line on that cork. Then put the mouthpiece right up to that and play a note. And um, they played a note and I said, oh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, I love the word interesting because it's so non-committal. And so they said, okay, let's try this. And I'd like to have you shape your mouth more O. Now, what they were playing was about a third line B, and I really want them to play a second line G sharp. So consequently, I had them shape their mouth more O. Now, early on, I was talking about the business of saxophone having a soft lower lip, which allows more of the flesh to go against the reed, which reduces some of the high frequencies, thus getting a really, really nice sound. So what we're gonna take a look at is an alto saxophone, a G sharp, a tenor saxophone, bottom line E, and a baritone saxophone, it too is gonna to be a bottom line E. Well, next let's transition to the brass instruments. So for that, I, uh, I teach with uh, a fair bit with just the mouthpiece at the very first lesson. And so what I ask my students to do and I'm, I'm gonna talk about trumpet, but I'm gonna talk about a, f a few of the other instruments. I ask them to take the mouthpiece and put it right between their teeth, like this. And there's really about four reasons I have them put it between their teeth. First of all, it keeps their teeth uh, apart, which we who are uh, brass pedagogues know that is the importance of that. Secondly, is that it keeps the throat open, which of course is critical to good brass playing. And the third reason is uh, it starts to form an embouchure. Watch. So I put it between my teeth and we've got a, a good start of an embouchure. And of course the fourth reason is the kids will quickly learn uh, to clean their mouthpiece because they don't want that grubby mouthpiece in their mouth. So those are the four reasons for that. Then what I do is, and again, we're talking about posture and air, inhale and exhale. And what I ask the students to do, again, is to sit nice and tall and straight. And I ask them to take their target, breathe out of the corners of their mouth.
And I found that a lot of young brass players don't use fast enough air. To demonstrate whether or not they're using fast enough air, I have them take a ping pong ball, I provide it for them, and I have them blow out. Now, I'm not sucking in, I'm oftentimes accused of that, but I'm blowing out. And if it's a fast enough air, it'll hold the ping pong ball in place. Now people say, well, how about French horn? Well, it doesn't work as well. You can hold it momentarily, but as soon as it gets off center, then the ball uh, falls. How about trombone and euphonium? Uh, same principle, it'll hold it for a while, but if it, once it gets off center, it doesn't work so well. And for, for tuba, I just have them use, instead of a ping pong ball, I have them use a bowling ball. No, I don't either. But uh, it doesn't work on uh, the tuba hardly uh, at all. So then what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna ask them to, uh, to form their embouchure. Now, I ask the students to moisten their lips. I know it's controversial, but I have my students moisten their lips and I have them then uh, shape their mouth one of two ways, either I am or O M. Both of the techniques there have strengths and, and some minor um, deficiencies as well. So I am O M and blow their lips apart. And then I'm gonna ask them to surround that um, buzz with their mouthpiece. And for all, I'm very careful to make certain that all brass instruments, with the exception of French horn, have half upper lip, half lower lip. And for French horn, it's two thirds upper, one third lower. Now, I'm gonna ask our um, and trumpet players in this particular case to hold their instruments properly. And I just want to spend a little bit of time on that because one of the things I want to do is want to make sure, and I use again the, the tennis ball, I want to make sure that the thumb is between the first and the second valve, the uh, index finger, ring finger, middle finger, and ring finger right on top, and then I have them rest their little finger in the hook. I say that because lots of times young players um, play with too much pressure because they're pulling on the, the hook. The hook is there, of course, just uh, to make sure you can hold your instrument if you're later on gonna use a mute or if you're gonna be turning a page. So that's the reason it's there. Now, what I'm going to do is ask them to play a note. And the note that they should play by pulling the tuning slide is going to be a D right below the staff or the E flat just above it. And again, if they're, if they're playing too high, I'm going to have them shape their mouth more ah, uh, or if they're too low, more uh, E, E, A, O, A, E, and they should be able to get a good sound. But let's take a look at how to get the kids started. So I'm going to have us take a look at pages four and five of their Tradition of Excellence book, or Standard of Excellence book for that matter. Let's take a look at pages four and five. So my job as the teacher, and notice how it says trumpet, cornet, and brass lesson. And of course, all brass instruments are transpositions of, uh, of one another. They're just larger than the trumpet. Um, and I'm gonna ask them, if you'll notice in the green little patch there in the center, I'm gonna ask them to play a note. And for some of the kids, this is gonna be their note that they play without any putting any buttons down. And I'll say to them, hey, that's a great low note. You get to start on page number four. And for some of the kids, that's a great high note. So they'd be start on page number five. Let's take a look at page number five. And so if you'll notice on page number five, as soon as we turn to it, um, that their notes are gonna be a G written G, F, E, or on page number four, it's gonna be C, D, E. And by the way, those two pages can be played simultaneously. So once we're able to get a good start on that, I'm gonna ask uh, the students 
Uh, I'm going to start then teaching them reading. And for reading, what I'd like to be able to do is to have all of us understand that this entire series is built on what's called sound before symbol. And sound before symbols, they hear it, they see it, and they apply it. So what we're going to be doing here is I'm going to find the starting note on number one. And so I'm going to ask them to go, me, notice my hands, me, me, me. Then I demonstrate it as the model, and then I ask them to play what they've been singing, and then I say, hey, let's take a look at page number uh, four or five, and uh, what you just played is that. Then I show them the fingering uh, for that, and then I say to them, okay, let's take a look at the similarities between number one and two. What are the similarities? Oh, it's the same rhythm. Hey, that's great. And so then what I'll do is I'll say, okay, then uh, there's page five, and so we take a look at that, and we say, okay, here's the starting note uh, for it, and I play it for them, and then we sing in movement, and you move our hand movements. The hand movements are critical. I was teaching just last week uh, an older gentleman. Uh, he was, I think, in his mid-50s, and he could get a sound, and but he didn't understand rhythm, so I had him clap, and he said, ah. That's what made the difference. So count, clap, sing, and play are the ingredients. Let's go to look at page number seven, shall we please? On page number seven, uh, okay, on page number seven, here what we're doing is, once we've gone through whole notes, on page number seven, exercise eight, we're gonna teach rhythm, a new rhythm study, and this is on half notes. But here's where it's key. It's hear, see, and apply. If it's not in the proper sequence, you're gonna have a very, very difficult time applying. So once we've taught them how to play half notes and half rest on exercise eight, look at exercise nine, exactly the same rhythm. Look at exercise 10, exactly the same rhythm, but just using those three notes. Let's take a look at the next page, page number nine. And on page number nine, we're going to introduce quarter notes. The key to that is, uh, let's see, I said nine, I meant, I meant to say eight. I think I was one page off. So here we're going to introduce quarter notes on exercise 15. And then notice this, the um, exercise 16 is almost a, is the same rhythm. And then 17 is where we incorporate the whole uh, the half notes and the quarter notes. And the same thing is true with um, eighth notes. Let's take a look at page number 14, shall we please? And on page number 14, you're gonna see an exercise uh, 43. Here's a song with eighth notes, excuse me, an introduction of eighth notes on three, number uh, uh, 44, a song with eighth notes on three. 45 has eighth notes on four, a song with eighth notes on four and then the test line. And then if we move on to page number 15, we're gonna see that we introduce the eighth notes on two and on one. Very methodical, very methodical, but very also very, very effective. So now let's take a look at some of the unique features of each instrument. One of the things I'm, I'm gonna to move to is our clarinet book. One of the very first things and uh, challenges that a clarinet player must learn how to do is we're gonna take a look at page number 14, exercise number uh, 35. I'm sorry, page 10, exercise number 35. Let's turn to it, shall we? Here's one of the big and first challenges of a clarinet player, and that is learning how to roll their fingers from E to A or D to A or C to A, because if they don't get it right, right from the beginning, if we don't develop that culture of excellence, of, of uh, achieving and striving for excellence, it's gonna be a challenge for the rest of their lives. 
So in this particular case, what we're going to do is employ the use of a professional clarinet player. And so we just go to the IPS, we click on the video cam, and we're going to have a, a lesson by a professional clarinet player. Finger roll to A. Playing certain notes requires a clarinetist to roll the left index finger from covering the tone hole to pushing down the A key. In this video lesson, I'll show you how to do this. The rolling technique must be used when you play from E to A or A to E. Watch my left index finger to see the proper rolling technique. If the first finger is lifted up instead of rolling to the new position, an extra note will be played. This is an important technique to learn, so ask your teacher for help if you're having trouble with it. Now, as a teacher, I want to extend that lesson. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, press on that same page right below that exercise. You're going to see where it says, we'll get right to it there. It'll say in the, that arrow, I'm going to click on it. And by clicking on it, it's going to take me right to more advanced studies of that. And again, this is differentiation, dealing with the basic preparatory exercise, advanced preparatory exercise, and finally the mastering excellence exercise. And what I have found uh, is that students want to uh, progress so that every child can be successful, but then they're gonna say, you know, I wanna do the advanced, or I wanna do the mastery one. And all of these exercises, uh, they can play right with the, the teacher, uh, and they can change speeds, and consequently, they can grow, but always being successful. You know, another technique is I'm going to have uh, Carly turn to the trumpet book. And as we look at the trumpet book, I'm going to uh, share with you that when I teach beginning trumpet, and we're going to go and play on um, page eight, and I think it's number 18 in the trumpet book, I teach my students that in D is played not just first and third valve down, but it is played the first and third valve down, but also extending the, uh, the valve. And it's been my experience, if you don't teach that right from the beginning, the students rarely will do that. So let's take a look at the video uh, cam and, and ask a professional trumpet player to teach that. Third valve slide technique. Certain notes on a trumpet will naturally be more out of tune than others. In this video, you will learn how to make one of those notes play in tune. Certain valve combinations are out of tune on the trumpet. One of the most out of tune is the valve combination 1 and 3, which sounds very sharp. That note is low D. Extending the third valve slide makes the trumpet longer, which lowers the pitch and allows low D to be played in tune. To play low D, extend the third valve slide approximately half an inch. These measurements will vary from trumpet to trumpet, so you'll need to listen closely to determine the exact distance to extend the third valve slide on your instrument. Here's something else to keep in mind. In order to be able to move the third valve slide properly, you must clean and lubricate it regularly. Well, using these tips that I've uh, been sharing with you throughout this session on inspiring excellence, 
with your beginning woodwinds and brass players. And by using these, you'll create a culture of excellence in your band program. And at this time, what I'd like to do is maybe attempt to answer some of the questions you have. So Carly, what questions do we have? All right. Hi, everybody. Well, I wanted to say thanks, Bruce. This has been a wonderful presentation. I absolutely love it. And Thank as you. Bruce mentioned at the very beginning, if you guys have not signed up, we are doing a fully new presentation next Wednesday at the same time on teaching percussionist for the non-percussionist teacher. And that will be as, with Bruce as well and another faction of the Inspire Excellence traditions. Um, so if you guys can join us for that, the sign up is in the same email that you received for this one. I am also going to be putting that code for the 25% off discount in our chat right now, along with our contact email one more time. And if you have any questions, please use the Q&A or chat. And we do have a couple already, Bruce. So the first question we have is, in regards to brass students, can you describe how you explain changing partials for those kids who get stuck either too low or too high, like a beginning yeah. trumpet who consistently would get stuck from G to C? A great question, and I'm oftentimes asked that, so I'm somewhat prepared for that. Keep in mind this, that your tongue really does make the changes, but it, you think of having them shape their mouth more O for low notes, A for mid range notes, and E for upper notes. Now, as I say that, those are relative um, pitches. So, for example, if I were going to go from a low C to an E, to a G, I'd go O, A, E, A, O, A, E, A, O. And what I oftentimes will do is I'll tell my students, try playing a, on your mouthpiece, a little song. <laughs> Until they're able to do that. Because we can't uh, play the various partials until we can play different pitches. Because remember this, the mouthpiece is nothing or excuse me the instrument is nothing more than an amplifier of what happens with the embouchure and and uh, being able to play so o a e a o okay great um the next question is what clarinet reed strength do you start on okay now uh, when it's impossible to talk reed strength without talking mouthpieces but let's make an assumption that they're playing on student uh mouthpieces that come with the instrument and that being the case i start my students on a uh, the equivalent of a two and a half as you know there's maybe a half a dozen reed manufacturers but by saying two and a half i think most of us would understand what that is some play some teachers start their students on one one and a half twos and i find that what happens is that never develops they never develop a great embouchure when they're playing on too soft of a reed. All right, that's great. <laughs> the next question, what are suggestions for clarinet players learning to cross the break? Well, remember, it starts right with uh, exercise number, uh, uh, page 10, number 35, learning how to roll their fingers properly. And that's why it's, it's a process. And um, I can't remember exactly the pages, but I think it's on page number 27 where they're actually cross the break. The first thing I want to make sure is that there are four, I think it's four, reasons why kids have trouble going over the, uh, the break. Insufficient air, insufficient embouchure uh, uh, support. Thirdly, they're playing on too soft of a read. So about a week before I know they're going to have to go over the register break, I have them put on a new read because even though it may have said two and a half or three, by now it's like about a one because it's been used so often. And the other thing is that they must learn how to cover their holes in their right hand. So what I've done is prior about five pages prior to them crossing the break, I have them learn to do right hand exercises. There are some real key exercises. And by the way, I think that cross the break is easier coming from top down than down up. And so therefore we've built those exercises in there specifically so that the students can master that skill. All right, that's super helpful. Um, one more question. 
If my students meet in separate instrument groups and join together for a full band rehearsal before concerts, how would you play together if the students are starting on different notes in the book? Well, um, remember that they're starting on different notes just to get them. The purpose of pages four and five is to get everyone to their starting note on page number six. So I, if they, if they are starting a like instrument class, I start them on page four, but I skip page five and go to page number six. If they start in a family of instruments, I start on page five, I skip page four and go to page six. And as you know, for the brass instruments, because they're all transpositions of one another, they can all start on the same note. But then exercise number one for full band, exercise one for full band is a unison note with all playing the same concert pitch. All right, that is super helpful. I think that is all the questions we currently have. Um, if anyone else has anything else to send in, please let us know. And I'm so glad that we've had you all with us today. This has been a wonderful presentation. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, it looks like we don't. So I think this is where we will say our thank yous. <laughs> so well, thank I wanna, you, Bruce. <laughs> I, I want to say thanks too for attending this webinar. And I hopeful that these tips will help you in your teaching. And uh, let's remember that next week on April 6th, we'll do the, a similar kind of lesson with the percussion instruments. So that's teaching percussion for the non-percussionist teacher. Wishing you all well, have a great remainder of the school year and uh, wishing you all the very best as you teach your students to make music and enjoy the process of music making. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, again, this percussion seminar that we are doing next week is in the same email that we sent out for this one. It's the same way of RSVPing and setting up through Zoom. You can also use the packet that we sent out for next week's presentation. It's going to be the same packet. We're going to go through the percussion book next week. And if you can't join us, the video will eventually be posted on our YouTube. So you can still use the percussion book and watch the presentation. So thank you all for joining us. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at email at Chaus. I did see that quite a few people are asking about professional, uh, professional development certif certificates for attendance. Um, sorry, that's a tongue twister. And if you do want one of those, Feel free to send us an email and I can email you our uh, written attendance certificates. They're not real certificates, but it is proof of attendance and you can use that if that's helpful. So feel free to email us. Thank you all again. Thank you, Bruce, and have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.